All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Harmony Barker. I am the Public Programs Manager at Holocaust Museum LA, the first and oldest Holocaust survivor founded museum in the United States. We were founded in 1961 by survivors who wanted to create a safe place to display their precious artifacts, to remember their family members and loved ones who had perished, and to educate future generations on the important lessons of the Holocaust. Today, the museum continues to provide free Holocaust education to students from across Los Angeles, the United States, and the world, fulfilling the mission of our founders to commemorate, educate, and inspire. Thank you for joining us for today's program, How a Polish Diplomat Saved Jewish Lives. Ellen Meth never knew the name of the man who saved her life. She was just a child when she and her father, Jewish refugees who had fled to Turkey in 1940, were declared Catholic by a diplomat at the Polish consulate in Istanbul, allowing them safe passage out of Europe. It would be decades before Ellen's son, Robert, would take it upon himself to uncover the identity of this unsung rescuer. Through diligent research and chance encounters, Robert Meth unearthed, unearthed the story of Wojciech Ryklovich, the Consul General of the Republic of Poland in Istanbul, who saved not just Robert's family, but hundreds of Jewish lives. Today, we are pleased to welcome Robert Meth, who will speak about his historic discovery and his efforts to have Reiklovich recognized as righteous among the nations. Also joining us today from the UK is Hani Awidi, Reiklovich's granddaughter. We are proud to present this program in partnership with the Consulate General of the Republic of Poland in Los Angeles. And we are honored to welcome Consul General Yaroslav Lizinski as part of this panel. Thank you all for joining us today for what I'm sure will be an enlightening program about this historic discovery. Before we get started, please note that there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the program. You can ask a question by typing it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. It is now my pleasure to hand the mic over to Robert Meth. Thank you, Harmony. Um, dobre, Boker Tov. Hello, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Bobby Meth. Uh, for over 30 years, I was a family physician and uh, I was fortunate enough to work with a large group, which enabled me to be very involved in the Jewish community as well. My life as a Jew and as a person really was shaped largely by my parents' past. Both of my parents were refugees from Europe during World War II. They hesitated to call themselves survivors because neither of them had a concentration camp experience. Nevertheless, their lives were upended by what happened during the Shoah. And that affected my life as well. When I was six months old, my parents moved from New York where most of their friends were and most of their friends were also refugees to a small town in New Jersey, where I think I was the only one I remember in my group of friends that had two parents with foreign accents. Both of my parents, obviously, being from Europe, uh, were, were set apart from everybody else, and that helped shape my life. But becoming a physician, I think, was largely influenced by my parents' past and being involved in Jewish life as I became during high school when I was president of the United Synagogue Youth region in my uh, state uh, were all shaped by their experience. I would probably define myself uh, more as a Zionist Jew than as a conservative reformer Orthodox Jew. Um, but since at least high school, I've been very involved in Jewish life, particularly the Soviet Jewry cause and Zionist causes. Soviet Jewry to me seemed an obvious way to get involved since my parents had been through the Holocaust and I felt it was my generation's obligation to prevent something like that from happening in the future. So I knew a bit about my parents' past, but it really came, uh, I really came to learn about my mother's past most when she decided to write her mem memoir in time for my nephew's bar mitzvah. It was actually in between my two nephews' bar mitzvahs that she wrote her memoir that she self-published entitled Kaleidoscope. 
And let me start by just reading the very introduction that she wrote in that memoir. It starts, the world I grew up in no longer exists. It disappeared not only because it all happened a long time ago and things evolve and change naturally, but mainly because it was eradicated violently and ruthlessly, wiped out in gas chambers and crematoria. Memories fade and by now there are but few of us who still remember. There was no one left to ask about what we have forgotten. Someday you too may want to know more about your heritage. By remembering, I am also keeping those whom I loved, cared about, and who influenced my life alive a little longer. The book was dedicated to my brother, myself, and my two nephews, Daniel and Michael Meth. And I reread that book. I, I became, I was very involved in Soviet Jury, as I said, but I became involved with Holocaust Museum LA as a docent there in the fall of 2013. And after the first or second class, my mother got very ill. I had to go back East. And within that period of time, she passed away. So I actually missed one or two classes before ending Shiva a day early so I could come back and not miss so many classes that I might get kicked out because I knew it would be more important for my parents that I be involved with the museum than observe strict talakha. And that was when I had an opportunity to reread my mother's memoir uh, as she was uh, laying dying. And um, I'll read a portion of that as well. Um, but to give you a, a, a short history, in, 19, in the spring of 1938, my grandfather got tickets to go to New York for the World's Fair. But my grandmother really wasn't interested in seeing America. So my grandfather took my mother instead and they went uh, in the early summer of 1939. Uh, they visited with relatives that they knew were there but hadn't met before. And my grandfather was also wise enough to buy an apartment building in Brooklyn, New York. Towards the end of August, they actually returned to Poland. Uh, even though they knew that war might be in the air, they were very loyal Poles and were confident that the Polish cavalry would be able to defend Poland. So they left at the very end of August and of course, on September 1st, 1939, uh, the uh, Nazis invaded Poland. And a few weeks later, the Soviets did. And by the end of September, there was no Polish state anymore. My parents, uh, my grandparents and my mother fled to what was then Lvov and is now Lviv. It was then in Poland, it's now in Ukraine. And because my mother and grandfather had been to the United States, and though they had one year visas that were only good for one uh, visit, that somehow enabled them to get a transit visa to Turkey since they had that US visa that was good for one year. So my mother and grandfather went to Istanbul and were there for several months. Uh, meanwhile, working to try to get my grandmother out. Let me read a little bit from my mother's memoir. Uh, they had gotten to Turkey and they were there for quite a while. And my mother writes, leaving Turkey and getting my mother out of Poland were my father's main concerns. We spent our days going from consulate to consulate, waited in endless lines just to get a visa application or to speak to some official without ever getting any encouragement. No country seemed to be inclined to offer us refuge. It was by sheer accident that we ran into Mr. Donyet a young attorney son of our landlord in Zeszów, the town where my mother is from in Poland. And he told us that the government of, Pol of Brazil had 10,000 immigration visit visas for Catholic citizens of Poland. Mr. Daniecz and his wife, both of them Catholics, were planning to go to Brazil on those visas. Polish Jews, however, had to have 10,000 US dollars already invested in Brazil in order to obtain the visa. Young Donetsk suggested that we obtain baptismal certificates, quote, just in case, end quote. He would then take us to the Polish consulate for further certification of our status. And in fact, miraculously, that's what happened. My grandfather was able to get a baptismal certificate, a phony baptismal certificate. And um, one of the people who hasn't been named yet, yet Kuba Kumach, Yaakov Kumach, 
who has been ambassador of Poland to both Switzerland and Turkey and is now working in the presidential office um, in, 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 in Warsaw has actually discovered the identity of the priest as well, who he believes came up with this document. With this document, um, my grandmother and my, my grandfather and mother went to the Polish consulate in Istanbul and my mother further writes, the Polish consul in Istanbul issued countless affidavits to Polish Jews trapped in Turkey. He certified under oath that they were Roman Catholics, knowing that they were not. And the only criteria was that they have Polish or neutral sounding surnames. My mother's maiden name was Wang, W-A-N-G. My grandfather's name was Simon. My mother's uh, birth name was Edwarda. And the baptismal certificate you just saw says Simon, the son of Joseph and Mary, which were not their real names, obviously. Wang was Catholic. His wife was Catholic. His daughter is Catholic, as was his brother and his wife, Henya, and her two children, Leopold and Hala Wang, who were not with uh, Fulek, my, my grandfather's brother, who was with my mother and father. But he, this baptismal certificate claimed that they were all Roman Catholics. Um, so uh, after my mother further writes, after we had obtained our affidavits, we in turn, like Mr. Donetsch in our case, brought acquaintances to the Polish consul and certified that they were Christian and thus enabled them to get entry visas to Brazil as well. These people too brought their friends and acquaintances to the Polish consulate for certification. My mother then asked the crucial question, what made the Polish consul act the way he did? Was it simply an act of goodness, an act of decency, I know for a fact that no money was exchanged. My only regret is that I do not remember his name, for he surely deserves to be remembered and honored for having saved hundreds of Jewish lives. And it was with those words and with, with that final challenge that since my mother died in October of 2013, I faced myself. Um, I had been involved since I was chairman of what was then NCSJ or National Conference on Soviet Jury and is now National Coalition Supporting Eurasian Jury, I had become involved with the Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations. And as it happens, they visit Israel every February. And prior to that visit, they usually travel to somewhere internationally of interest. So in 2016, the trip was to Turkey and to Egypt before we went to Israel. And when we were in Istanbul, we had a dinner with the Jewish community there. And one of the guests just so happened to be the Polish consul general in Istanbul at the time. So I made sure to meet him, told him my story and uh, initiated my search with him, although it didn't get very far. Since I'm involved with Holocaust Museum, I attended a, pro a program there a few years ago about the, uh, the, the Munich soccer team during World War II. And it was then that I really made the uh, great, um, I had the great pleasure of meeting Yaroslav uh, Lashinsky, who's the current consul general in Los Angeles representing the nation of Poland. Uh, we met very briefly, but by total coincidence, a few months later at the gala dinner of the uh, Holocaust Museum LA, I happened to be sitting right next to Yarek and we had, well, he had the, the, the sad opportunity to have me chew off his ear for the rest of dinner, telling him the story of my mother. I then sent these materials to um, Consul General Lashinsky, and it's really he and Ambassador Kumach who really deserve the bulk of the credit for making the final, dis uh, the final discovery and um, conclusively identifying Wojciech uh, Rychlewicz as the man who was responsible for these documents. Uh, so you, you see, you saw the baptismal certificate and I believe Harmony also showed the certificate there that uh, Consul General Michlevich um, uh, signed. So finally, the mystery was solved. And my main concern was, did he have any descendants? Didn't he, ha did he have any relatives who could learn 
or maybe share more information about uh, this wonderful man. And um, let me, I think this is a good time to uh, let uh, Council General Lashinsky uh, talk about where he took it fr from that point. All right, thank you, Bobby. I believe that uh, you overestimated uh, the role I had played in discovering the identity of the consul in Istanbul who signed those uh, those fake uh, uh, certificates and um, uh, baptismal certificates and acknowledgments of uh, you know uh, being a, a good Polish Catholic to uh, those uh, Jews who were trapped in a wartime Istanbul. Uh, it, I just happened to know uh, where to send those documents and ask those who can uh, do some uh, archival research. The problem is that it was coincidental at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, so uh, uh, it took longer than expected because some of the archives were closed. Um, the crucial was the archive in Warsaw and the one the, in London that held, holds uh, documents uh, left by our wartime government in exile that was London based at the time. Uh, and obviously, if you see the document on the screen, uh, there was no name, just the Council of Poland uh, in French and some signature. So we took a lot of effort and a couple of people digging into the archives to find out who was the man that the signature belonged to. And then this name, Wojciech Ryklewicz, came up and this is it. If we're talking about my role, I was just, you know, uh, uh, somebody that passed on to people who did research. And good thing that it, uh, it was taken over by, um, at the time, new ambassador to Turkey, Jakub Kumok, uh, because um, he was instrumental in discovering another story about wartime Polish diplomats that saved the Jew. And actually, um, I can tell you this, that it is a real shame that so many years after the war that we are still trying to learn what really happened, what Polish diplomats, my esteemed colleagues in the job I'm doing, were doing during the war time. Um, there were two things I believe that uh, um, contributed to the fact that we didn't have any knowledge about. First, it was many years of the communist uh, regime uh, governing in Poland that actually suppressed all that knowledge, especially if it was related somehow to Polish government in exile that was uh, on the other side of uh, political kaleidoscope uh, and uh, landscape of the time. And I believe the second one is the modesty of those diplomats involved who never talked publicly about what they did to save other people's lives in uh, during the war time. I mentioned uh, uh, Ambassador Q, uh, Kumok and his role in uh, discovering and uh, public publicizing the story of uh, Polish diplomats from Bern, from uh, Switzerland in the war time. Uh, it just happened that uh, a couple of months ago, I was really honored to be able to partner with Holocaust Museum LA to um, show to the Los Angeles public uh, an exhibition uh, containing uh, documents and the story of four Polish diplomats and two Jewish activists uh, working in, in Switzerland, water neutral Switzerland, trying to falsify Paraguayan passport to save Jews uh, from being sent to death camps, not only from Germany occupied Poland, but also from other countries, namely Belgium and Netherlands. Um, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, you can still go to the museum and uh, watch the uh, exhibition Passport for Life by yourself before you will go to another places in the United States. And I believe this is it of uh, what I was uh, uh, able to tell you about the story. It's all credits to you, uh, Dr. Matt. Thank you. Uh, you're too modest, Jarek. Thank you very much. Uh, we've become friendly, so... Uh, You'll forgive me for calling you by your familiar name, I hope. Um, this, not only has this been a great opportunity for me to become friendly with you, but I have a brand new friend from a little further away. And uh, that new friend is the granddaughter of um, Wojciech Michlewicz. Uh, 
Fortunately, her name is a little bit easier for me to pronounce. And it's Hanya Witte or Anna Witte as she's uh, formerly known in, in royal circles in Great Britain. Um, the acorn doesn't fall very far from the tree, we like to say. And Hanya, without even knowing much about her grandfather's uh, uh, past, um, has lived a life of service as well. And for that, she has been recognized by the queen through Prince Charles, actually, as a member of the British Empire. I think, I think that's what MBE stands for. Hanya will correct me. But I believe it, it's something like the third highest honor one can uh, achieve within Great Britain other than being a knight or, uh, uh, or, or uh, uh, I guess the equivalent is a Dutch. I'm not even sure what the equivalent is for women. But Hanya uh, for many years ran a scheme uh, within Great Britain that provides uh, uh, bus transportation, public transportation to those individuals who would otherwise find it inaccessible both in rural and in urban areas, whether it be because of disabilities or lack of service because it's a remote area. And for that, she was honored by the, uh, by the royal family several years ago. Uh, but we, through, through the, the good fortune of Zoom, have become friendly as well and have actually finally gotten to know each other. The, the real surprise was, and because, and, and because she wasn't mentioned in the um, publicity materials, uh, Hania was originally planning to be here in Los Angeles right now because she originally was planning on t attending a wedding just uh, a couple of days ago or two or three days ago, this past weekend in Santa Barbara. So we thought we were finally going to get to meet in person and that hasn't happened quite yet, but we hope that will happen soon. But we've met a couple of times on Zoom and um, I'll let Hania tell uh, us a little bit more of her story and what she was doing in Britain, but maybe we can start, Hanya, by telling us how you found out about your grandfather and what he had done during the war. And good evening to you. Um, good evening from London, and uh, thank you, Dr. Meth, Bob, uh, for that uh, lovely introduction. The, the moment I found out uh, was uh, through, a mess, uh, through an email that I read on my mobile whilst at work and written in black and white, it, it just brought out the emotions. I, I just burst into tears because of the enormity of hearing something like that about a, a relative that I am directly descended from. And actually I do remember him. One of the things that you and I have in common is that we were both very young when our grandparents died. My grandfather, I was five and a half when my grandfather died. And you? Uh, I was eight years old. Uh, I barely remember my grandfather. I, do, I don't remember him as an individual. And I'm not sure that the sort of I was old enough to be able to have done that anyway. But I do remember him being very tall and, uh, and perhaps a little bit scary. Uh, partly because of his height, but one incident I remember clearly like it happened yesterday. We were sitting at the dinner table and he took a knife and knocked my elbows off the table. And, uh, and that was probably a very valuable lesson in <laughs> etiquette at sitting at a table. Uh, but so, but that, that's just about all I remember. Uh, my brother, my two brothers, who are also listening in uh, on this Zoom, uh, were younger, and obviously their memories will be lesser. My, my youngest brother were, were, um, wasn't even born at the moment my grandfather died. But um, the, the, it's so sad that he died so young. He died of lung cancer. He was a heavy smoker, which was very common in those days. And uh, my brothers and I worked out that one of the reasons we have so little memory is we probably didn't see him much during a period when he was seriously ill. But um, so you, did, you knew nothing about his past, but when I asked you once, you said you're convinced your mother knew nothing about his past as well. How, what, what do you know about her life in Istanbul and 
What more can you tell us about that? Well, uh, my mother was very young. She was uh, uh, born in 1932. So she would have, um, I know she, she was born in Warsaw uh, and I believe they would have left quite young. She, uh, the, the family uh, took the, the Wojciech's mother with them. Uh, so the, the grand, the, my mother's grandmother did a lot of the looking after whilst my grandparents were involved in, in the di diplomatic service. Uh, but my grandmother, my mother would have been spoilt at the time because a, a child in that kind of environment, uh, an only child, but she, she, I don't actually think she knew anything. And uh, when I first heard of the story and I was being asked questions, I sort of rang, rang, rang around the, the family. Uh, I've got second cousins who are a little bit older than me, uh, but they were brought up in communist Poland and they, their parents wouldn't have told them anything, even if they knew, uh, because of the, the, the danger that would have put the whole family in. But I, I, I don't, I think I would have heard something from someone if there was any inkling. Uh, but I think what we've got to remember is that that whole generation, the survivors of the war, and I think your mum's quite unusual, uh, Bob, maybe because she lived a little bit longer. But um, the, the Polish generation, very few of them talked about what they would went through. They started their new lives, whether it was in the UK, whether it was in America, because that was very common, and they started a new life and put what had happened uh, directly behind them. So I, it's not a surprise that my mother wouldn't have known. Never again was a very important concept in our household. And even though neither of my parents grew up, uh, I would say religiously, my mother didn't even light Shabbat candles on Friday nights generally. We didn't have a kosher home. We didn't observe a lot of Jewish law. I, I became more involved Jewishly in my involvement in the United Synagogue Youth, the, the youth group of my synagogue. But one thing that was very important was Jewish identification in our home um, and support of Israel as a, uh, a, a, a safe place where all Jews, thank God, could go, which wasn't obviously in existence uh, when my parents were growing up. I have family scattered to this day in eight different countries around the world because when my parents were trying to get out of Europe, as my mother wrote about her experience in Turkey, there, were, there was no place that was opening its arms to Jews. So I think that may explain a little bit about um, why I knew more. But why is it that you ended up in Great Britain? You would think your grandfather was a, a diplomat. He would have returned to Poland um, with great comfort and great acclaim, but he ended up in Great Britain instead. How did that happen? Uh, well, what, what I must explain is that uh, anybody who was active in what could be termed as the old Poland, and, and maybe uh, Consul General Jarek can confirm this or, or, or explain more, but it was the, um, any, and anybody who was active during the war, uh, if they were to go back to Poland, their life would be in danger, and um, and that wasn't that's that was a real threat and plenty of evidence that it was happen happening. So there was no prospect whatsoever of any of the Poles returning uh, if if when they ended up as refugees at the end of the war. Uh, but so the the a lot of Polish people, and, and I mean, particularly my grandfather's uh, family ended up in Italy. Uh, and the, 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 the resettlement uh, of so many refugees, reuniting families, the whole of the, the second corps, the General Anders' army, as, as it's become known. And there, there was a lot of international diplomacy as to who would take these refugees in. And, and I'm, you know, and I'm not belittling the situation with Jewish people scattered uh, around Europe and, and anybody who survived, uh, but there were a lot of Polish survivors who, who suddenly found themselves stateless. And it was only after a while that the British government relented 
and uh, agreed for Polish people to come to, to the UK. And that's how my grandparents ended up in, in the UK and settled in London. But I, I'd like to share with you a, a little anecdote in that um, in that period when uh, he was to be discharged from the army, he was asked, uh, the, the forms asked, where would he like to go? Where would he like to settle? And the countries that he stated was France, Belgium and Italy. And, uh, and I personally would love to know why why that didn't happen and, and whether perhaps it was political, but he was a, uh, he spoke four languages, he, apart from Polish, he, he spoke French, he spoke German, uh, he spoke Russian, and he spoke a fair amount of English. So it, it, I think uh, French, French is obviously the language in Turkey, uh, so he, he would have been very fluent in that, but, but he ended up in London. And, uh, and that's where then my mother met my father and I was brought up and, and slightly different to you, Bob, I was brought up in a very enclosed Polish community where uh, the, the older generation, my grandparents' generation, from what I'd heard and remember, had a belief for quite a while that they would return to Poland, that the situation in Poland would change and they'd be able to go back. Whereas the younger generation, those who had missed out on their education during the war years, uh, were very keen to get educated and to settle down and get on with their new lives. So there was a difference between the, the two generations. I think most pe many people listening to this conversation uh, are familiar with the idea of Jews as refugees when it comes to people that grew up in Poland and are less familiar with the idea of Polish refugees, because I think in the United States, the uh, Polish diaspora here is often an immigrant community. And of course, the difference between a, a refugee, as I learned very well through my Soviet uh, jury experiences, a refugee defined in the United States is somebody who is, uh, has a well-founded fear of persecution if they're to remain in their country. So uh, your, your parents were not immigrants like so many in the United States who come from Poland were be, uh, seeking economic uh, advantages of living in the United States, but they were literally forced not to be able to go back. They, they weren't, they, it would have been at the risk of their life to have returned to Poland. So I, I find it particularly interesting that you and I are both descendants of refugees. And, and I don't think many uh, people who have a background like I do often think that there were Polish refugees, as you were. Do you want to talk any more about that and how uh, that affected um, your grandfather, your mother, and yourself? Well, first of all, uh, and I think there's a little bit of irony, and I, I, I hesitate to use the figure because I'm not 100% sure, but is it, and, and uh, Yannick might um, uh, might know, was it 300,000 Polish people got deported to Siberia? Uh, and it was mainly from a region where my grandfather came from, which was from the East. So it, the irony is, is that when he joined the army, when, when he left Turkey in 1941, it was that army that he joined. And so that, all those people uh, ended up being refugees. Then there was also a lot of Polish people uh, who did end up in concentration camps. And my father's first cousin is a survivor, was a survivor of Auschwitz, uh, Auschwitzim. Uh, and, and whilst it would have been a, a minority, a smaller number, and I don't want to get into that, but Polish people did also end up in uh, Auschwitz. But when, when we ended up in London, and my brothers, my, my younger brother who's 10 years younger than me, but perhaps slightly less or so, but post-war growing up in London was quite surreal uh, in, in, in the closeness of that community and what we did. Uh, but but it was they they I spoke Polish fluently I could read Polish I could write Polish 
And both my parents were dedicate, dedicated, 30 years between them, of ensuring that we continued to be able to read and write through the Polish Saturday School. So it was a very uh, unique upbringing uh, where we uh, followed all the Polish customs, sometimes more so than people in Poland. You know, we, we, were, we knew all the Polish uh, uh, war songs uh, through the scouting movement, you know, through the various, we, we, we all learned to dance Polish. I mean, Jarek, I, I, I probably can dance better Polish uh, dances than, than you can. Um, because because it was that part of the um, the culture and the growing up that we were so immersed in Polishness. Let, let me ask you, Yark, not about your dancing skills, but um, we know that in the case of the Bern group, the Lado, the Lado group, that it was with the consent of the Polish government in exile. There's a lot of documentation about that. Have we learned any more since the, the discovery of Rychlewicz? Have we learned any more about what the Polish government knew about his activities? Do we know whether this, we, we know that there are many, many Poles trying to get out of Poland and neutral Turkey was one place they could go. Although there was a concern that if there were too many Poles coming there, the Turks might uh, react uh, and, and, and start to limit immigration of Poles through Turkey. So it was, in the interest not only of Jews to get out of Turkey, but there was some interest um, of the government, theoretically of Poland, to get Jews out of Turkey, hopefully through the use of visas in the example of my grandfather and mother's case, to let them move on so perhaps other Jews and non-Jews from Poland could be saved through Turkey. Have we learned anything in the year or so since we made this, this discovery about what the government knew about what uh, Council Rychlewicz was doing, whether it was at their orders or whether they looked the other way. What can you share with us about that? Thank you, Bob. I would say that to my knowledge, we don't have any anything new in that matter. But I can tell you, as a consular officer myself, it's hard to imagine that uh, he would do such a massive perjury of those documents without the consent or at least knowledge of the government in exile, because he was just a consul of himself. He was reporting to the foreign minister based in London. And it was the same with, uh, with the Bern group from Switzerland. It started on their own initiative, but they reported it to uh, London government and it was accepted. And um, even uh, London government upon the uh, insistence of uh, Minister Wadosh, uh, talk to Swiss authorities and to uh, Latin American countries not to reveal to German authorities that those passports were forged. But uh, let me go back for a while to what Hania Witte uh, told us about uh, being forced not to go back to Poland, but to live in exile. It started, uh, it's all history, started with the revenge of Molotov Treaty and division of Poland between two occupiers, right? Back in September, 1939. But then uh, uh, when Germany invited uh, Soviet Union, uh, uh, there was uh, a diplomatic uh, relations established uh, between uh, Polish government exile and Soviet Union. So uh, Soviets uh, enabled to form uh, the Polish army, so-called General Anders Army, back in, U in the USSR, made up of those who were either sent or exiled in the Soviet Union. But it ended. It ended when the, uh, the truth about cutting massacre was uh, discovered when 22,000 Polish intelligentsia uh, officer, officers, uh, clergy, uh, lawyers, uh, policemen were just uh, murdered by Soviets. So uh, the General's Army uh, uh, went out through uh, 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 Kazakhstan to Iran, to Palestine, uh, to join the forces with uh, Western allies to fight Germans. Then, of course, uh, there was this Italy campaign and so on and so on. After the war, many, many Poles, those who were either former soldiers of the Polish armed forces in the West or former uh, fighters from the underground Polish Home Army 
were not able to return to Poland. Those who returned were tortured, uh, were uh, court-martialed, and were executed. It is very sad that even their bodies were hidden and uh, were buried in unmarked uh, mass graves, and we still search for these bodies, so for them to be, to be properly buried and remembered. So after the war, a new term was uh, made. It was, uh, we call those people DPs, meaning displaced persons. And many of them ended up here in the United States, not as immigrants, but refugees, because they could not go back to their homeland, to Poland. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, before we go, I, I, I'm sure we want to go to questions from the audience in a moment. I just want to mention one other thing. First, I'd like to acknowledge a few other people. We acknowledge uh, Jakub Kumoch, the uh, ambassador who was in uh, Istanbul at the time of, or in Ankara at the time of the discovery. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge um, at least Eldad Beck of Israel Hayom, who broke the story originally, uh, as well as uh, several other journalists, including Maria Krell from a, a German uh, magazine, I think it's called Spectrum, and my good friend Eve Heck, who's a professional translator who translated that article into English. And uh, there are several articles. Uh, there were articles written um, uh, in uh, JTA and uh, the Times of Israel. I think JNS picked it up as well um, in the uh, English speaking world. Um, and um, I uh, would also like to explain that the, um, the designation of righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem uh, is a very complicated and involved designation. And I have submitted the name of, uh, of Wojciech Wichlewicz to the committee that investigates whether or not somebody can get that designation. Whether or not he gets that designation, it's clear to me that Wojciech Wichlewicz was a, uh, a hero. And uh, when I, I conclude tours at the Holocaust Museum in Los Angeles, I generally end up in a room where we talk about those who were willing to show courage and resist the Nazis, including several diplomats, like Sempu Sugihara, who was in Countess Lithuania during the war, and uh, Aristides de Souza Mendes, who was Portugal's consul in um, Bordeaux, France at the time. These were people who risked their careers uh, by doing what they did. And, um, there is a concern that because Miklevich was in a neutral country, Turkey, that uh, there may be a consideration that he wasn't putting his career at risk. And that may somehow influence the committee about whether or not he's designated among those who are righteous. But certainly in our mind, he's righteous and certainly a role model. And I said, as I conclude with the groups that I lead, which are usually middle school, or high school groups. We just had a group on Friday that I toured that came in all the way from Arizona, like a seven hour trip each way to visit the museum. I tell people that the lesson that I hope they'll bring home from our museum above all uh, others is that one person can make a difference. And that was the case of Wojciech Wiklewicz and that was the case of too few other people. Um, but I'm grateful, obviously, because I wouldn't be here for your grandfather, Hanya, and for the great opportunity to become friends with you. Um, Harmony, do we want to open, are, are there any other questions that you have that you wanted to bring or, um, let, me, let me turn it back to you so we still have time. Sure, well, we actually have uh, quite a few questions coming in from the audience. So um, I think we'll go ahead and, and try to answer a few of those um, while we have time, if that sounds good. Uh, so we have a question uh, um, for you, uh, Bob, uh, if you could say again how your mother and, um, and grandfather ended up in Turkey, what their, um, their path was to ending up in Istanbul. Okay. Spring, summer of 1939, my grandfather and mother went to New York to get to New York to visit the World's Fair and to visit family and ultimately for my grandfather to buy property in the United States, which enabled them then to get their permanent visas to the US. They had a one-year visa. 
The one year visa was good for only one visit. So they went to New York, they came back to Poland, not really thinking that the war would happen. When the war did break out, my grandfather was very, very wealthy. He owned a lot of land and property. And when I say my becoming a doctor had to do with my parents being Holocaust survivors, it's because my mother realized that I might have to, at some point in my life, pick myself up and move halfway around the world. And she wanted to make sure that I'd be able to take care of myself. Because her father owned lots of land and was very wealthy and could bring none of it with him, she emphasized that I needed to have something that I could bring with me, which was the education and knowledge. So my grandfather had a lot of money. He had this uh, one year visa to the US, which was only good for one visit. But somehow he was able probably to bribe an official to give them a transit visa to Turkey, which would enable them at least to get out of the immediate war zone. And Turkey was a, a, a neutral country. So they got a probably a typical three month visa to Turkey, which limited their time there, but at least gave them a place to go out. And it was when they were in Turkey that they then started to look for a final destination. So they left, they, they, they were in Lvov, from Lvov, they went to Odessa. And from Odessa, they took a ship to Istanbul. And that's where they settled for several months. And as you heard, there were many, many other Jews who had managed to escape from Poland and were there, but had no place to go as of yet. Thank you. And we actually have um, some questions about kind of the next phase in, um, in that journey of what was the connection between Turkey and Brazil and the Polish government in exile and and why why was it Brazil um, you know and whether was that uh, something that the Turkish government was allowing was it something that the Polish government had a connection with? I, I think many countries in South America were seeking Europeans for their education and their knowledge. Um, uh, my my because they then had Brazilian visas. My mother writes my mother writes about the fact that. She was the translator. They, they had to go to a, a, a doctor before they could get the visas. And uh, the, the, the doctor spoke French, which my mother was able to translate into Polish for my grandfather. So she, she translated the medical history for the doctor. And the doctor couldn't understand why my grandfather and his brother both were circumcised since they were Catholic. So my mother pretended she didn't understand the question. But because they had these visas, they then went to uh, Damascus, from Damascus, they went to Baghdad, and then they went to India, to Bombay, where I believe there were ships that were going to Brazil. But they decided to stay in Bombay for quite a while. And since my grandfather was a property owner in the United States, he was able to get a United States visa. All the while, they were trying to get my grandmother out of the love, which had become Soviet occupied. And as I learned later as a, an activist in the Soviet Jewry movement, once my grandmother was part of the Soviet Union, I'm imagining it was impossible for her to get an exit visa because that was the obstacle that Soviet Jews had until the, the fall of the Soviet empire. So all the while my grandfather and mother were keeping in touch through the Red Cross with my grandmother, trying to figure out a way to get her out. They stayed in Bombay for, I think it was close to a year, and by the time they got their U.S. visa, my grandfather's brother wasn't able to get a visa to the U.S. because he didn't have any property. He ended up in Shanghai for a while before he eventually came to the U.S. But my grandfather and uh, mother went to Kobe, Japan from India. And from Japan, they crossed the uh, Pacific to Seattle. And from Seattle, they took a train to New York where they ended up. Wow. So they hit most of the continents on their yeah. way, on their way here. And obviously they couldn't go um, east from uh, Lvov, which was the same as those Polish Jews who were beneficiaries of Sugihara's uh, transit visas. Just as in Countess Lithuania, um, it's interesting that the, the, all, almost all the Jews Sugihara saved were Polish Jews and very few were Lithuanian. And I have to imagine that was because Lithuania was becoming occupied by the Soviets as well. And it's so uh, Lithuanian Jews, therefore, weren't able to get exit visas from there. But Polish Jews uh, were able to get exit visas, and therefore they were able to be beneficiaries. But their only direction also was through the east. They couldn't go further west from Lithuania like 
my uh, grandfather and mother couldn't go further uh, west from Turkey. So they had to go the Eastern route uh, eventually through Japan. And what uh, ultimately happened to your grandmother? Did she, was she ever able to make it out of Poland? My grandmother, we believe was protected for a while by some Gentile friends of my grandparents, but ultimately she went to Bergen-Belsen and she perished in Auschwitz. So I never got to meet my grandmother. My grandfather died when I was about five. My father was from Vienna. His, his parents uh, followed my father's sister to Buenos Aires, to Argentina. And I never got to meet my father's parents either. So I only met one of my real grandparents and he died when I was five and a half years old. So we really had very small um, extended family. But uh, sadly, I never did get to meet my grandmother. Let's see, we had some, thank you for sharing that. We have some questions um, about uh, um, your mother's book. Um, when did she start to write it? And we also have a question about um, whether uh, at the time that she wrote it, um, you mentioned that she dedicated it to um, uh, to her her grandchildren, and there's a question of whether she had more grandchildren after the book was written. That uh, I, I I've never married, so she only has the two. Um, my grand my my nephews were born in 1993 and 1990. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 1983 and 1986. So their bar mitzvahs would have been in. 96 and 99, and the book was printed in June of 1998. Um, it's been self-published. I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way to get it digitized so it can be available uh, more widely. Um, I haven't figured out the way to do that quite yet, but it also includes pictures of her life. Her, her, her goal was to teach her grandchildren particularly about the Shoah through her own eyes because they knew her and they hope, she hoped that personalizing the show off for, for my nephews would make it more real to them. Uh, this next question uh, is for uh, Hania. Uh, you mentioned an, an email that you received that sort of uh, was the, the inciting um, catalyst that, that brought you to discovering your grandfather's story. Um, uh, we have a question from an audience member who would just like to know more about the, the email. Uh, so I, I, I saw the question come up and I have found the email and the sentence, the paragraph says, we have, this is from Jakub Kumov, we have reasons to believe that Consul Riklevich, who served in Istanbul 1937 to 41, was a massive Holocaust rescuer who provided hundreds of Jews with fake papers, including false confirmation of Roman Catholic religion and fake Latin American passports. That's pretty strong stuff. You can see why I would have been upset, emotional or have a, an emotional reaction to that. The man who previously had been known only as knocking your arm, your elbows off the table. And, you know, I think we have a, um, we have a picture um, of your grandfather. Let's see, I'll put it up um, before we end today. And I like my ironies. And I think the irony is that um, my grandmother was, uh, did, did a lot of work with the Red Cross uh, during the war and after the war, res rescuing orphans and uh, placing them with families, Polish orphans. And uh, the family rumours was that uh, my grandfather was in my grandmother's shadow. Now, physically, I'm not quite sure it's possible because she was about half his size. But, but you can see how the story, the family story had developed, <clears throat> that my grandmother was the hero, uh, but no mention of my grandfather who, who had his own story. Harmony, I wonder if you have the photo of 
this past Christmas in London. Yes, I believe I do. I wonder if we could. This? This is Hanya with her grandson at the gravesite of Wojciech Kuklewicz. The photo itself doesn't actually show my grandson, but uh, yes, we um, we laid a wreath. Oh, there, there is, there, you, you see the other one? There, there, there should be two photos. <laughs> And it's um, it, the Polish people in London were buried in whatever sort of cemetery that was local to where they were living. And in the 60s, it was quite common for people to be buried in Isheen, which is part of, and, and the Londoners will understand, Hammersmith and Fulham uh, Council. That it's, it's a very sad cemetery. It's very neglected. Whereas where my parents are buried in Gunnersbury Cemetery, where again, there are a lot of Polish people buried, or whole families are buried there. Uh, it, it, vibrant may not be the right word, but at Christmas time, there was so much candles, so many flowers, uh, clearly very well looked after cemetery and graves. So it's just and, very sad that my grandfather's ended up somewhere that is so neglected. And this past May, a, a monument was, uh... Uh, unveiled in Istanbul. Do we have a picture of that monument? That There was a state visit of the president of Poland to Turkey this past May, and this monument in uh, Consul Rychlewicz's memory was unveiled. I believe that it's a Polish cemetery in Istanbul. It's interesting that there was a, there's a long-standing Polish, small Polish Catholic community on the outskirts of Istanbul that I think dates to the mid-19th century, Yarek might be able to tell us more. Um, and it, I believe it was the uh, head of the parish there that provided the phony baptismal certificates. Do you, do you have any other information about that, Yarek? About the Polish community and the priest who uh, provided the phony baptismal certificates? No, unfortunately, I do not. Uh, but the truth is that uh, we have a long history of Polish immigration to Istanbul and Sabarvia. There is the South Polish village of Adampol that uh, uh, was established uh, 200 years ago, and it's still host housing uh, lots of uh, uh, Poles and uh, you know Polish school, Polish church, and Polish folk groups. So. Um, I believe that this is the connection that we are talking about, and especially that during the partition time when Poland was not in event for 123 years, uh, Turkey was the only country that did not recognize that, and uh, they still maintained, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Poland in their hearts. <laughs> are there any other questions, Harmony? Let's take a look. Um, I think we have, uh, we have answered a lot of the questions. Um, so uh, do Bob, um, do you want to say any uh, kind of final, final words today? Um, I, I will just conclude that among the Jewish teachings that have steered my life is one that uh, has guided me in many instances of my life, both in the Soviet jury movement and this project as well. And that is that though one is not obligated to complete the task, neither is one free to desist from participating in that challenge. Um, those words have, have uh, stood by me and led me through a lot of the decisions I've made in my life. And I don't know if I ever expected to find the answer to the question of, of who this man was. And I don't know if we'll ever know what it was that motivated him to do it, but I'm very, very grateful that he existed and even more grateful that he has family that can know about it. And, and, I, and Hanya has mentioned it and I, I've mentioned it. I, I feel so privileged to have been able to grant Hanya the gift of a family legacy that can, she can share with her uh, grandchildren and her brothers can share with their grandchildren as well. And that can be a lesson for everybody in the future.
And again, that lesson is one person can make a great difference. Uh, well, I just want to say thank you um, on behalf of Holocaust Museum LA to um, Consul General Lozinski, to Hania Witte, and to Robert Meth um, today for such a, a fascinating and enlightening uh, conversation about um, this unsung hero. And I, I hope that uh, new discoveries continue to be made and that there's, it sounds like there's more to learn. Uh, and so we hope to be able to continue that conversation going forward. Um, so I want to thank all three of you for sharing your time and your insights with us today. Um, we also extend our heartfelt thanks to the Consulate General of the Republic of Poland in Los Angeles for their continued partnership. Uh, before we sign off, I want to invite everyone to join us again on Thursday at 11 a.m. for our weekly virtual Holocaust Survivor Talk. This week we will hear from survivor Dana Schwartz. Uh, you can also join us next week on Thursday virtually um, at 6 p.m. for a program commemorating International Holocaust Remembrance Day uh, on the 77th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. 3D modeler and mapping expert Pavel Belsky will discuss the layout and function of Auschwitz from his unique perspective as a cartographer. You can find more information about our virtual events on our website at holocaustmuseumla.org. Also, a recording of this program will be made available on Holocaust Museum LA's YouTube channel tomorrow. Holocaust Museum LA brings you programs like today's at no charge. If you are enjoying our programs, please consider supporting our work by becoming a member. To learn more about our membership levels and benefits, you can visit holocaustmuseumla.org membership. Uh, you can also visit our website to learn more about the Passports for Life exhibition that uh, we have on display in partnership with the Polish Consulate. Uh, it's still on display for another couple of days, I believe. Thank you again to Robert Meth, to Hania Witte, to Consul General Jaroslaw Lozinski, and to the Consulate General of the Republic of Poland in Los Angeles, and to all of you for joining us today. Take care, and we hope to see you again soon. Just as a reminder, the museum is open to the public. We are closed on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, but we are open Thursday through Monday. Uh, please feel free to visit our website and learn how you can visit the museum. Uh, thank you again, and um, take care, everyone. Thank you, Bob, Hania, and Consul General. Thank you. Goodbye.